School of Library Information Science. My name is Yingu Shi Yi, and I want to welcome you all to tonight's event. It's with great pleasure that I introduce to you uh, the archivist of the United States, Mr. David Ferriero. <laughs> <laughs> this is his third year. Uh, he's just starting his third year as the archivist of the United States. And I want to tell you a little bit about his background. Mr. Ferriero was sworn in as the 10th archivist of the United States on November 13, 2009. Previously, he served as the Andrew W. Mellon Director of the New York Public Library. And in his position, in that particular position, he was part of the leadership team that was responsible for integrating four research libraries and 87 branches, branch libraries, uh, into one singular uh, service for users. He was responsible for collection development, for collection strategy, conservation, digital experience and strategy, reference and research services, and education programming and exhibition. And before joining New York Public Library in 2004, he served in top positions in, at MIT and Duke University. Mr. Ferriero earned bachelor's and master's degree in English literature from Northeastern University. So we can be sure that he's highly analytical and very smart. <laughs> because that's, those are the traits of English majors. <laughs> now you can guess what my major is. <laughs> he also has a master's degree from Simmons College from their School of Library and Information Science. And he served in the Navy during the Vietnam War. And uh, Mr. Ferriero is going to talk to us about the National Archive its nature, its mission, as well as the profession's future. So please join me in welcoming him to the Thank you. It's great to be here. I'm going to use a podium since it's standing here. So if I stand here, is that all right for you? And if I take off my jacket, would that be all right with you? <laughs> Thank you. So one of my friends in my 31 years at MIT is sitting at the back of the room, Ran Hawk. Ran and I work together at MIT. It's really nice to see you. So thank you for that kind introduction. And my thanks to all of you here at the Libra School of Library and Information Science for inviting me to be part of your colloquium series. It's an honor to help you celebrate 100 years of library science classes at Catholic and the 30th anniversary of the school. And as the first librarian to be named archivist of the United States, it's a, sp it's a special treat to be talking to you today. So I'm going to begin by talking about um, two of the biggest challenges facing the National Archives and Records Administration right now preserving the nation's record in a digital age, and ensuring that the national heritage, the national memory, which is increasingly digital, is open and accessible. And then I'll say a few words about the future of the archives in general, and the National Archives in particular, and conclude with a topic that should be of special interest to those of you who are looking for jobs, because I'm, I'm going to be talking about what I'm looking for in terms of recruits at the National Archives. And there'll be plenty of time for questions. Um, and I find the question and answer period um, in these sessions much more useful than me just talking at you. And I have been making an effort to get out to the schools around the country uh, to talk to students, uh, to get to know what's on your mind. I've visited Pitt, Simmons, Chapel Hill, Mississippi State, and Wayne State so far. So I'm, uh, I'm working my way across the country. So the challenges for the 21st century, I have to start by going back to the 20th century into 1934 when the National Archives was founded. And I have to admit that from our first day to this one, we've had a bit of an identity problem. When Robert Connor, the nation's very first archivist, reflected on his early days in Washington, he reported, after my arrival in Washington, friends invariably introduced me to strangers with the apologetic explanation Mr. Connor is our first archivist. With a perfectly blank stare, the other invariably countered with, and just what is an archivist? And more than 70 years later, I still have to explain to many audiences, no, though not this one, <laughs> that we are not the Library of Congress, and we are not the Smithsonian. 
What we are are the nation's record keeper with our duties set out in two sets of laws, the Federal Records Act and the Presidential Records Act. On the federal side, we're charged with holding and preserving only the 2% two to 3% of government records that are considered of permanent or historic value, legal or historic value. On the presidential side, everything is record. We now hold approximately 12 billion sheets of paper, 40 million photographs, miles and miles of video and film, and we hold about 5.3 billion electronic records, the fastest growing part of the collection, as you might expect. Let me uh, give you just one illustration of that growth. As you know, we operate and maintain the presidential libraries. The presidential libraries, the Presidential Records Act was amended in 1996 to recognize electronic records. So the Reagan administration is the first where we captured electronic mail. So we have 8 million email messages from the Reagan administration. We have 20 million from the Clinton administration and we have 210 million from the George W. Bush administration. And George Bush loves to tell me when I see him, uh, we're, you know, we're building the newest library in Dallas, and every time I, he's very proud of the fact that there are so many electronic records because this is going to be the most electronic presidential library yet, and he loves to tell me, and not one of those is mine. <laughs> <laughs> He and Mrs. Bush are now online. They are using Blackberries and they are you know, sending emails, but not when he was in the White House. So that 210 million uh, easily exceeds all the electronic records held by all the other presidential libraries combined. Not only that, but if you printed out all those emails, they would total about 620 million pages of documents, which is more than the entire collections of all the presidential libraries combined. As extensive as they are, the Bush emails are, to say the least, just the tip of the electronic iceberg. At the end of September, we hold about 124 terabytes of records from Congress, the federal agencies, and the White House. And we just received 331 terabytes of electronic records from the 2010 census. Moreover, as this audience knows well, the tremendous growth in the volume of electronic records is just a part of this century's preservation challenge. The other pressing issue is the changing formats of digital media. The problem being that each new format wipes out the one that came before. So think back to the year that, that the first class entered your school, 1981, was the year IBM introduced the PC, which ran the MS-DOS operating system. WordPerfect came along in 1982. You probably never lived through, but I did, floppies. Fox Pro, Nav Net Netscape Navigator, and my favorite, Epsidic. <laughs> Epsidic was a language created for the IBM mainframe, and NASA used it extensively. And so we are stuck with all of NASA's records in Epsidic. The good news for the National Archives is that when it comes to electronic records, we've had the benefit of forward-looking leadership, people who anticipated many of the challenges we'd be facing. For example, in 1998, NARA electronic record specialists saw that we needed a flexible, scalable system so that we could not only store the skyrocketing volume of electronic records, but also handle the wide variety of formats used by federal agencies in the White House. To meet those future needs, the archivist at the time, John Carlin, approved launch of a major new initiative, the Electronic Records Archive Project, the ERA. The goal of ERA is to preserve electronic records and make them accessible while allowing federal agencies to conduct their records management transactions with NARA electronically. We received the first functional part of the ERA system for federal records in 2008. It included the basic electronic record storage system at a secure off-site location, an undisclosed location, connections to NARA facilities and the records management workflow for scheduling and accessioning records. We then added a specialized component of ERA for presidential records, followed by a simple system to meet the needs of congressional records. This year, we added a component to designed for the restricted records of the 2010 census and another component for national sec security classified records. Less than a month ago, NARA concluded the initial development phase of ERA and selected IBM to provide operations and maintenance going forward. 
And as we enter the operations and maintenance phase, ERA is now storing those 124 terabytes of records from Congress, the federal agencies, and the White House I mentioned earlier. Moreover, working with the Office of Man Management and, Bu and Budget, we've embarked on an ambitious plan to have every federal agency adopt ERA for scheduling and accessioning records in all formats by the end of 2012. The second major 21st century challenge facing the archives stems from our commitment not only to preserving records, but to making them as useful and accessible as possible for our customers. Our customers, of course, are the American people. Thomas Jefferson wrote, whenever the people are well informed, they can be trusted with their own government. That whenever things get so far wrong as to attract their notice, they may be relied upon to set them to rights. His words resonate even more powerfully today. To keep a democracy healthy and vibrant in the 21st century, its citizens must be well informed. Information, especially about the actions of government, must be circulated, available, and put to use by as many people as possible. At the archives, this ideal is embedded in our mission. In addition, President Obama has made it clear that this ideal should be part of the mission of all government agencies. Last month, he underlined that commitment when he spoke at the General Assembly of the United Nations and discussed the United Nations, the United States National Action Plan for the Open Government Partnership. After introducing that plan, the President announced his administration will soon be launching a new initiative to reform records management. That initiative, he said, will seek a reformed digital era government-wide records management framework that promotes accountability and performance. This, of course, is music to our ears. It's always nice when your boss recognizes the importance of the work you do, especially in front of an international audience. At the Archives, ERA is one of the tools we're using to promote open government. Late last year, we launched the online public access. It's the public portal that gives our customers access to our digitized ERA records, as well as information about records in all formats. You could call it the Google for the Archives. At the same time, we're promoting, op promoting open government by working to make previously secret documents in our collection available to scholars and other customers. Not many people realize that the roughly 12 billion pages of government documents at the archives includes about 400 million pages of classified material, which, with more being produced every year. 400 million, that's 23 miles of pages stacked one on top of the other. One of the most important offices within the National Archives is our Information Security Oversight Office, ISU which oversees the classification and declassification of government agencies, ensuring public access where appropriate while safeguarding s classified national security information. In late 2009, at the direction of the President, I established the National Declassification Center, or NDC, within the National Archives. Its job is to process all those 400 million pages by December 31st, 2013, declassifying as many as possible. These documents go back to World War I. The executive order spells out the only two reasons a document maintained, contained within this 400 million page backlog may keep its classified status. It contains still sensitive information related to weapons of mass destruction or to national security. Those are the only two criteria. To process the documents, the NDC first goes to the agency that produced the document and has them review it for sensitive information. After the agency does a review, recommending what can be released and what should be held back, we begin processing their decisions. Just to complicate things, in many cases it turns out that a single document contains classified information drawn from several agencies. Each one of these agencies may, may have its own standards for classifying and declassifying documents, and each has to be consulted. We try to speed this up by having the representatives of all the agencies on location at our facility in College Park. Of the nearly 400 million pages in the backlog, 217 million pages have been assessed and 108 million pages have passed the quality review process, the cr crucial first stages of declassification. Of the 23 million pages that have been reviewed, fully reviewed, we're proud that 20.6 or 90 percent were declassified and put on open access to researchers, 90 percent of them. So that's a very good track record. And I'm, ver I'm proudest, I think, of 
the six oldest documents from 1917 and 1918 have been released. The CIA finally caved on those six documents. Um, they've been FOIA'd forever, and the CIA would not release them. They are six wonderful documents, which you'll find on my blog. Um, they're German formulas for invisible ink. <laughs> and Leon Panetta had this great press conference in April and announced the release of these documents and, you know, got, grabbed all the glory for releasing them. But what he didn't say is that my staff in the National Declassification Center, using Google Books, discovered that they had been published in 1930. <laughs> so having spent five years at the New York Public Library working on Google Books, I was very pleased to see that the staff has uh, found a use for uh, <laughs> that wonderful new archive. In addition, we're working to establish efficient business processes to str streamline declassification. One example, you probably don't know this, but there are more than 2,500 different classification guides at, at use right now in the federal government. And we're trying to reduce that number in order to make the guides more consistent. 2,500 is a lot, um, but it's down from 9,600 um, probably seven years ago, seven or eight years ago. We're also very involved in a request for documents under the Freedom of Information Act. In fact, our Office of Government Information Services oversees the enforcement of FOIA and has earned the nickname FOIA Ombudsman. Its job is to resolve disputes between, request, between requesters and agencies under FOIA, and much of its energy is aimed at resolving disputes informally. So how are we doing? More than 1,200 Freedom of Information Act requesters from 48 states and 13 foreign countries turned to the Office of Government Information Services for assistance in its first two years. Created by Congress in 2007 and open two years later, OGIS reviews agency FOIA policies, procedures, and compliance and provides mediation services in an effort to avoid litigation between FOIA requesters and federal agencies. Requests for assistance range from questions about how to file a FOIA request to inqu inquiries about resolving disputes pertaining to the use of exemptions to withhold certain information. OGIS has helped veterans, researchers, professors, journalists, attorneys, and inmates, among others. In several cases, OGIS has helped requesters who were advised by federal agencies that their FOIA requests had been referred to other agencies for processing. The wonderful bureaucratic government loop. The agencies did not identify the name of the agencies to which they were referred. <laughs> Um, so our staff was able to track down the original request and um, provide some resolution. The request appeared uh, lost in this big black hole known as the U.S. government. I oh, just worked with the agencies to obtain the status of the request, in most cases, the name of the agency to which the request was referred. So that's just a taste of what um, our, this new office is doing for the American public. Preserving records and keeping them open and accessible in the digital age will, rem will remain difficult challenges, but for now I think the archives is on the right path toward meeting them. Now let's look a bit further into the future of archives and libraries in general as well of the, as the National Archives in particular. Changes in technology of information will continue to be important, of course, but I would ar argue that the more profound change facing librarians and archivists is the fundamental shift in the mindset of the consumers of the information we preserve. When I was studying at Simmons, researchers, whether scholars or amateurs, had to rely on gatekeepers, professional librarians or archivists, to get the information they wanted. Sometimes this was by choice. Navigating your way through an archive often required special training. Sometimes it was by necessity. Researchers were excluded from stacks to prevent theft or damage to materials. I call this the special library approach. Today, that, that approach has been pushed aside. We live in a time of powerful search engines, the rapid digitization of books and records, and the growing consumer demand for transparency and accessibility from all organizations, public, private, and nonprofit. Researchers want to be able to access and parse out information for themselves. At the National Archives, we're encouraging employees to evolve, to stop manning the barricades, and find ways to open more doors. 
Which brings me to the part of the speech I predicted would be of most, most, most interest to you. It's the part where I try and answer the question, given all these changes, what skills are we looking for in the National Archives and new hires? First of all, we're definitely considering people with a broader range of background than was the case when I was a grad student. In addition to library science, history, and other subject matter areas are important. Above all, we want people who can connect archival work with real life experiences. Te technical savvy is a given to work in a modern archive, and by savvy I mean not just experience with the latest technologies, but also a sense of excitement about putting those technologies to work. Next, with all the rapid change going on, today's archivist must be highly adaptable and able to tolerate ambiguity. To be honest, some of the students I taught at Simmons back in the day wanted a job that would be reliable and predictable year after year. Today, if you need a blueprint of what your job is going to be like in five years, the archives isn't for you. You also have to be very comfortable with collaboration. Can you play well with others? Working with diverse people and a range of organizations is more important than ever in an era of shrinking budgets. Finally, and this may be the biggest change, we're looking for people with strong awareness of the need to serve customers, human customers. Sadly, if you ask many veteran archivists who their customers are, they may well say the records. But an archivist in the 21st century is no longer about sitting down with a box of records for years and years. To work at the National Archives, you must be able to meet and anticipate the needs of the public, both individual researchers and other agencies and organizations. And in closing, I want to quote a great American who knew nothing about the 21st century libraries or archives, but who understood very well why our profession is so special. Franklin Roosevelt, in dedicating the FDR Library in Hyde Park, Franklin Roosevelt, who created the National Archives, said, to bring together the records of the past and house them in buildings where they will be preserved for the use of men and women in the future, a nation must believe in three things. It must believe in the past, it must believe in the future, it must, above all, believe in the capacity of its own people so to learn from the past that they can gain in judgment in creating their own future. As you celebrate the milestones of library science at Catholic University, embrace the challenges of the field, revel in the historic opportunities presented by new technologies, and remember that you are helping America create its own future. Thank you. So I'll be happy to answer um, anything that's on your mind um, about what I said or what I didn't say. Um, yes. Can um, you tell me who you are first? Uh, I'm Harry Brooks. Uh, I'm a retired librarian uh, uh, in, career, in career transition. Uh, in the 1980s, I was sent up to the Seattle uh, storage yeah. facility yeah. Uh, to reclaim... Regional facility. Re whatever it's called. Regional, <laughs> regional facility? Yeah, that's what we call them now. Okay, I was Storage has a bad, you know, <laughs> it's not very user friendly. <laughs> no, they were very friendly. Okay, good. Uh, but the news that they gave me was bad. Yeah. Uh, I was working for the Albany Research uh, Center, uh, which had helped to develop a zirconium sponge uh, for Rickover, which actually became yeah. the Nautilus, uh, the technology to put nuclear power into the submarine. And uh, they had suddenly realized, well, this scientist did it, but his records had been trusted to that, uh, had already been sent up there. So I was sent up to either to copy them or to reclaim them if I could. Uh, up there I discovered, or I was told, they had been burned years before. Burned? Burned, burned deliberately destroyed. burned? They, they used the word <laughs> destroyed or something. Really? But uh, my question to you, is uh, has anything that was in 1980? Yeah. Has anything happened in the in the National Archives organization that enables them uh, to have some kind of glimpse that these are valuable records and they shouldn't be destroying them? Or we're not sure, so that, <laughs> that should give them a little longer life. Who destroyed? Where where was the where did the destruction take place? 
at, at the correctly named institution you, you identify. Yeah. I, I find that hard to believe. Um, the archives takes in the two to three percent that the agency and the archives believe are of legal and historic value. We don't do any destruction. The destruction that takes place, the things may have changed. This may have happened in 1980. I'm talking about what happens now. It, those uh, 98 or 97 percent of stuff that doesn't come to us doesn't come to us. It's destroyed by the agency. But my question to you is, has the institution realized, hey, this does happen, and has, has thoughtful... Uh, yeah, we have, a, we have a live example going on right now. It's called the SEC. Have you been reading about that? For 20 years, they've been destroying records. Uh, yes, we're not turning them over to you. No, they've been destroying them. The Security and Exchange Commission. Preliminary investigations. For 20 years, they have been destroying them. It's been a thr in, uh, you all have seen this in the papers, I hope. Yes, yes. It, it's still a problem. The National Archives uh, has, um, has responsibility for 275 federal agencies providing guidance. If we don't know that they're even creating these records, it's kind of difficult for us to, to be able to say, don't destroy them. Not the answer you wanted. No. What, what would you like me to say? <laughs> Somebody here has realized we need some way to predict that these records are going are of some value, and we should. But that's what the whole appraisal process is all about: working with the records manager in the agency and our records manager in creating the record schedule for those materials. And there are laws, aren't there, that are supposed to be they're supposed to be informed of those laws in order to keep those records. The Federal there. Records Act. I didn't mean to take the whole floor. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm lucky. I actually work for Fall 3. Um, Why is it called Fall 3? Because Fall 3, previously footnote.com, now specializes in historical military records. And during um, a military burial, the, um, the ceremonial folding of the flag, the third flag represents the veteran's life. Very good. <laughs> I don't have I don't have anything to do with the the, the, the corporate side of. That's what I said. I've said that. Yeah. So my question is twofold, is what do you see... Um, twofold. Yes. <laughs> um, what do you see as um, the future for supplying um, NARA with the resources to continue its digital projects? And I only see everything from the historical record, like the yeah. historical records that are being digitized. Um, I'm not sure, not sure what NARA's digital lab is doing, but are they, um, are they imaging historical records only for the public, or are they also more recent, the congressional records, um, stuff like that. So, um, I didn't mention congressional records because we don't really own them. Okay. Congress owns them. Mm -hmm. So, and they are involved in some thinking now about digitization activities. We provide courtesy storage for right. congressional records. So, our stuff is the federal records and the, and the White House. So, uh, I, I have, you know, I have been very public about this, that, that for um, the generation of students who are now, uh, actually this was, I, s I made the first statement when I was at Duke, um, that uh, undergraduates' first line of defense is Google, and if it's not online, it doesn't exist. You know, that's a, a loose, loose translation of what I was saying, but, and we, um, you know, I worked for eight years at Duke with librarians wringing their hands about how are we going to train the students to, that they're still paper, and and we got to get over that and figure out how can we get it digitized and, and you know make that make that a reality. So for me now, um, 
It is thinking cleverly about how we use existing resources. How do we harness the, um, the amazing amount of digitization that's going on right now in my agency in 44 facilities across the country? So for, um, based on customer demand and a, a creation of a digital repository that captures that stuff because what's going on right now is that we scan it, provide it to the customer, and don't do anything with it ourselves. So you know, we, we're losing a lot of opportunity there. So we have the commercial partnerships, uh, Ancestry.com, um, you guys, um, and we will continue to do that. Uh, but but you've, you know, as you know, a very small percentage of what we have has, has been done so far. And there's something on the horizon um, that I'm sure you've, you've, I hope you've heard about, called the Digital Public Library of America, which is an opportunity, I think, for a new kind of public-private partnership to first of all aggregate all the digital content that's been created in this country, but also uh, to provide funding for new digital um, programs, new digitization uh, projects. There's um, an amazing amount of private foundation money already on the table from um, both Arcadia, the Arcadia Foundation and the Sloan Foundation to you know, kind of uh, jumpstart the, the thinking around this, this project. And I'm very pleased that the federal government agencies like the National Archives and Smithsonian and the Library of Congress are at the table from the very beginning to think about um, a government content that, that we have. I'm very pleased about archives because having, as I said, having lived through the Google project, the Google Books project, archival stuff was not, any, not even on the radar screen. Um, so this is a real opportunity to get that whole um, arena at the table. Somebody up there had a question. Oh hi. Um, what's been you've been an you've been an academic librarian, a public librarian, one of the research libraries at uh, New York Public Library. What's been the biggest surprise, biggest challenge moving from librarian role to archivist? Um, this, you know, there was during the the confirmation process. You know, when my nomination was announced, there was a lot of discussion. Um, about um, me not having the credentials you know, to, to do the job. Um, in fact, there's a woman named Harriet, who I'm still looking for, who I haven't seen, who posted a blog on a blog. He's only a librarian. <laughs> <laughs> so I haven't met her yet, but I keep using that, hoping that she'll <laughs> raise her hand in some audience that, that I'm in. Um, you know, when you cut it, cut it down to, to basics, it's uh, collecting, protecting, and providing access. You know, whether it's a record, and of course the, pro you know, the content is different, the processes are different, but you know, when you cut it down to, to you know, what we're doing here, and just to remind you all, in all of those jobs, I was responsible for records management and archives, you know, at MIT, at, at um, Duke. I created the, the records management program at Duke. I um, was responsible for the archives and at the New York Public Library. So, um, I, 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 I think I have the credentials. What, what I found exciting, and let me just tell you, when I got the call from the White House um, in 2000, May of 2009, I was in my office in New York. My assistant came in. The White House is on the phone. This 12-year-old says, I'm calling from the White House. And I said, yes. And he said, Aren't you surprised? <laughs> <laughs> Aren't you surprised? What can I do for you? And he said, you know, we're looking at you for um, Archivist of the United States. And I said, you know, I'm really flattered, but you're looking at the wrong guy. You know, it's um, ordinarily someone who's given a lot of money to a campaign <laughs> uh, or, someone, or a PhD historian, and I'm, you know, I'm neither one of those. So we called back Monday morning, we had the same conversation, and uh, I said no twice, you know, and finally an adult called. <laughs> <laughs> so. My name is Kathy Kelly, I'm an alumna, and I'm also a certified archivist. I have a question about the job requirements you mentioned that have changed over yeah. time. Um, some of us, I think the archivist position description at NARA used to require 18 credits in history or a comparable field like poli sci. Do you think that's still going to be the case, or can you, would you be able to get into the archives with a library science special collections type background that you might acquire at Library of Congress, other sorts of places? 
Subject um, expertise, a subject background, uh, would be important. It depends on the, the kind of job that you're applying for. So it, it's kind of hard to to um, say that, that you wouldn't have a place. We, um, you know, a lot of what we do is history, so you know, that that's um, very useful. I have a history minor, but I'm, I'm certainly bringing myself up to speed in lots of areas that I never never studied before, especially the Civil War. <laughs> I'm a current uh, graduate student in the SLIS program. Um, for your new hire job requirements, you said that the, you're looking for a strong awareness of serving the human aspect. What are some changes or implementations that you have done now that serves that human aspect? The open access and transparency. We've just gone through a, a major uh, reorganization. We've described as a transformation where we're kind of um, rethought how we should be organized and, and focus um, for the for the agency and put the customer at the center of what we're doing rather than the record um, so looking at every service we provide um, from a customer's viewpoint um, this has been uh, in process now for about a year um, the last piece of it uh, to be implemented is our research services piece of it, and that includes the creation of a, a customer focus group, customer advisory group, uh, internal and external, um, so that we really focus on listening to our customers and uh, responding to the changing their changing needs. Um, we are doing um, a lot of thinking about planning for customer service uh, training. We're about to launch some focus groups for, of staff uh, who are dealing with the public um, about uh, good examples of customer service that they experience. We're starting from the perspective of in your own lives, as you lead your lives, where have you seen examples of good customer service? And what can we learn from that? I know from personal experience, things like um, FedEx, L.L. Bean. Uh, there, is, there are certain you know, companies where you expect, Nordstrom's is another one, where you expect to get good service. And so what are the elements of that? And in fact, bringing in some of the people who train in those um, companies to you know, start this conversation within the staff while we're uh, reorganizing this whole, this whole cluster of of activities that represents research services. This one's um, pretty important to me since I grew up, my entire career has been in public service. Um, so I'm really focused on this. There's a great article in, in the uh, Washington Post Sunday Magazine several months ago, uh, an interview with one of my archivists um, who talked about the, the two kind of people who work at the archives the ones who like to hide in the stacks and not talk to people, uh, and the ones who like to work with people. And we can't afford to hide in the stacks. You know, we, we've got to be out there with, with the people. With, with some money. Right, right, with some of the private money. But I also know that as, they, as each successive one has gotten bigger and more expensive, that there's been talk about changing the model of how the, the presidential libraries are run. It's not really the size and expense. It's got to do on the other end with the older libraries' um, inability to raise money. So. So the way it works now is there is a percentage of maintenance th um, that needs to be provided by the foundation uh, that comes to the, the archives to, to maintain it. And it's based on fundraising. You know, so there is a direct relationship between the death of the president and the foundation's ability to raise money. Okay? So the Hoover Foundation, not to pick on anyone, but the, uh, <laughs> the Hoover Foundation isn't raising a lot of money. Uh, that's, that's where the, the issue is. And I'm a, you know, I'm a huge fan of the presidential libraries and have visited, I'm about to visit the 13th, the last one, 
Um, and every one of them uh, plays an important role in the communities in which they sit, and it gives you a, such a perspective of the individual. You know, so you go to Hoover, it's in the middle of a cornfield in West Branch, Iowa, the house, the, the library, the grave site, you know, it's, it, it, you know, it's a very moving experience. Um, the the um, K through 12 kinds of programs that each one of these do is, are, are just extraordinary. So um, the contribution that they make to the um, uh, educational you know, history and civics and the digitization projects that are going on, and many of them are to spread it um, you know, uh, around the country, are, are really powerful. So, but you know, if you look at what it costs to maintain right now, it's about a quarter of the archives budget goes to um, the presidential library support. And if you look, if the projections out to 2035, I think is what the study was, it, it takes up more than half of the, of the NARA budget. So something's got to give. Yeah. Um, my name is Catherine Stinson. I'm a first year student at Catholic Human Library Science Program. Um, you mentioned earlier about um, digitizing archives. What's the process for doing that? Is it simply just scanning archives and uploading them, or is there more to it? Like metadata? <laughs> yeah, one of the biggest challenges, uh, especially dealing with the folks on the Hill uh, around funding, is explaining how complicated digitization is. Because it's not just scanning it, you know. It is the, the intellectual effort that goes into um, uh, describing it and making it retrievable. I mean, that's, that's, what, that you wanna, that's what you wanna do. So, for the stuff that we're doing with our commercial partners, uh, it's easy because the metadata is being created and, and generated and given back to us. You know, when, when we edit. Uh, for the the material that is being scanned by us, and we've done a, a lot of it ourselves, um, we're creating the metadata ourselves. But it's it's expensive and it's slow, and we're we're dealing. It's compounded by the fact that there are preservation issues with that old stuff, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's difficult to, to work with, so it slows things down and it, it makes it more complicated. And, and all that stuff has to have preservation review before it gets anywhere near a scanner. So that, that's another um, making it more expensive, the preservation treatment involved. And for the stuff that's being created for, as part of orders for customers, um, it's kind of minimal level uh, metadata. And I would you know, I don't, I haven't seen a lot of this, you know, up close and personal, but I would be surprised if it qualifies as retrievable metadata. But I would have to, I would have to check that. And do you know? Yeah. It's already very retrievable. Very good. One of our staff. <laughs> Google. Yeah. Um, and that's probably got to be a big part of changing yeah. culture. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's, uh, we're, we're still using 1950s uh, archival processing routines, um, which categorizes everything by record group, you know, which makes sense, um, which made sense at that time. And it makes sense if you're the agency whose record group that is. But if you're a researcher and you want to know everything that the National Archives has on whatever, you shouldn't have to know the record group. You should be able to see that. That's where the gatekeeper thing comes in, you know, because we've got people who have been using, dealing with these records forever, and so they know what record group um, you want to go to. So we need to translate that into making it easy for people to find it themselves. That's a, that's a huge challenge. It means rethinking those basic archival processing uh, routines. I uh, pick up on that. I, I actually had the opportunity to work on the actual the archival data uh -huh. the website. Yeah. They were redesigning it. Yeah. And one of the big challenges was that at that point, there was a lot of resistance to changing the way that you provide access um, outside of the, the rec file record group structure. And I noticed with the online public access thing that they're actually introducing Yep. And, you know, yeah. The, so the whole question of discovery with this explosion of electronics.
electronic records and with all the open government uh -huh. government initiatives. Uh -huh. I'm sort of wondering if you could just sort of tell us where do you think that's going in the discovery side and how are you going to help people find and organize and make sense of all this data? Well, one of the um, one of the lessons I learned at the New York Public Library when we created the Digital Experience Group was that that we have research libraries have uh, since the mid early to mid 90s have built these wonderful digital libraries and expected people to find them <laughs> just as just with, as we've built you know physical structures and expected people to find them and that doesn't work uh, it does not work in this environment so what I learned from Josh Greenberg, who was my digital experience guy at the New York Public Library, was let's figure out where they are, where are the people, and get our content in front of them where they are. So in that, we're, we're doing that at the National Archives also. So if you're looking for a photograph, you're not going to the National Archives to look for a photograph, you're going to Flickr. So get your photos you know, where they are. Same with film, YouTube. Um, you know, use the, the, the spaces where the users expect to find that content um, and get as much of your content there as you can or uh, hooks that will drag them back to, to um, your site. So the discovery process is um, lots of experimentation, trying a lot of stuff. I'll give you a good example. Um, we have a Wikipedian in residence. We're one of six institutions in the world with a Wikipedian. <coughs> Dominic is a graduate student at Simmons. Um, he's actually taking this semester off um, from Simmons uh, to, to do an extra semester with us. And he is um, focused on getting our content exposed to a wider audience through uh, wiki tools. So we have this thing on our, um, on our website called Document of the Day, where our public affairs staff picks a, you know, an important document um, that's uh, particularly important for this particular day, has a, a little uh, descriptive information about it, gets about 1,000 hits on a, on a regular day. Dominic took one of these and put it on Wikicommons, 12 million hits. So looking for those kinds of opportunities to to um, get our content out where people are. Um, my name is Jill Strickland. I'm a current Swiss student. And I used to work at the National Archives as an um, archive steward, as a student employee. I was in the microfilm section and we worked on, we were working on digit digitizing the microfilm. Yeah. It's been a while since I was there. Um, is, that, is that still, still going on? Is that process still going, going strong? And are, we, are you still planning on keeping the, keeping the microfilm? even after you digitized it, because when I was there, we were planning on keeping, keeping the microfilm. Um, the backup uh, geez, how many backups do we need? I mean, we have the originals, and we have the microfilm. Um, I'm, we're, we're doing a lot of microfilm um, transfer to digital commercially. I'm not sure what we're doing in-house. I'm not sure we're doing any in-house anymore. Mm. Um, that, that has been up at the archives recently, and I was just wondering, um, it's just a, such a wonderful way to actually connect sort of the meaning and, and what your holdings and um, just the, the amount of work that it took to put that together. And I don't know if it was just like purely NARA staff or if you had other people working on it too, but are there plans to have more exhibits of, like that in the future? We've got, we've got exhibits going on all over the country. Uh, in all, just about all of our um, sites, all the presidential libraries do exhibits. Wonderful new Watergate exhibit recently opened at, at Nixon. Um, the regional archives even have small exhibit spaces. There's a b huge um, premium on uh, using exhibits to educate folks about who we are and what we do. Traveling exhibits, the, the um, Civil War exhibit is in Houston right now, just opened in Houston, for instance. Uh, it's one way of us you know, kind of advertising ourselves. Also, digital um, uh, representations of those exhibits, also, so people can see them online. Another one. If you haven't been recently downtown, um, what's cooking, Uncle Sam? The government's role in food. 
incredible. Absolutely incredible uh, exhibit. Uh, fun, disturbing, scary. <laughs> uh, it's, um, you know, the, the food pyramid, how it's changed over time. Uh, my favorite is 1941, the seven food groups. Butter was a food group. <laughs> Aha. Uh -huh. Not the same time as you have ER, ERA. So I, from that time, I, I got there. I kind of helped my students about the project and get the actual word uh -huh. Yeah. Sure, love to do that. Yes. Yeah. 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 This is, you know, this is. Um, <laughs> we have been. Uh, let me be honest with you. You know, we've been working on this thing since. Um, 2003, perhaps. Uh, the contract was signed with Lockheed in 2004. Um, this has been a very complex um, project, and um, it's been through some ups and downs. Um, we we um, finished development in September. We've got 30 agencies who are now on board. We're training uh, the other 167 agencies, um, and as I said, they all have to be on board by September 2012. So, but we'd be happy to um, um, have your class come. You can send me an email, and I'll I'll connect you. Thank you. Yep. You you've had one. Uh, I I'll come back to you. Yeah, this, this Electronic Records Archive was built um, very much with um, a lot of uh, intelligence from the um, Australian and European partners who were building their own at the same time. So we've incorporated a lot of um, advances that, that they have um, developed. In terms of standards, um, I'm not as, I'm not I couldn't say the same thing about um, international standards around electronic records. I don't think so. Um, the last time I was at NARA, actually, I, I was one of Professor Jones' students, but um, we visited NARA um, in, as part of the Federal Libraries Institute. Yeah. And somebody did talk to us about the Electronic Records Archive, and the price tag that, that I, I believe I heard from him was $500 million that contract? Is that completely off? What, how, can you tell us? Yeah. Um, I used to have this in my head because I was asked it once a day. Uh, <laughs> there was a, um, um, an o o um, OMB report that cited $500 million. It was in the press. It was based on a development schedule that went out to 2015. So it's like $105. Forty-eight million dollars, I think, is the price tag. But don't hold me to that. <laughs> yes. Um, my name is Ken Marco. I'm a SMIS student here. I'm also a contractor in the Library of Congress, where we're actually digitizing the uh, commercial records. Ah, so very good. Good. <laughs> Glad to hear it. Uh, my question to you is that there's an increasing number of, increasing amount of convergence between archives, and libraries, and museums around. 
country. I was wondering what you foresee that, if that, be, that being a thing with the National Archives, the National Library, and the National Museum, and the National Archives, Library Congress, and the Senate. Yeah, I'll tell you um, a story I haven't told a lot of people, but when, when I finally did listen to that 12-year-old and came to Washington to talk to people in the White House about the job, uh, just off the top of my head without knowing anything, said, suggested that, um, <laughs> that they think about combining the National Archives, the Library of Congress, and the GPO into one mega agency. <laughs> what a fool. <laughs> no way. No way. Although, it is the model in, you know, I just came back from a meeting of the International Council of Archivists. These are all the National Archivists from around the country, the world. And ma most of them are responsible for the National Libraries also. It's the National Libraries and the, and the National Library and the National Archives. Um, it, I was going to say it would take an act of Congress. It literally would because the Library of Congress reports to Congress. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't see it happening. Not that I know of. No, not that I know of. No, that's one of the things that you know, when I was talking about the Digital Public Library of America, that's one of the th one of the reasons for you know, launching this effort is because there's so much digital activity out there that is uncoordinated, unknown, and there is no one source to go to to find out what's what's been done. So it's kind of um, this discovery process, you know, searching Google and um, word of mouth and. <laughs> right, a great student project among the, all the programs <laughs> across the country. Go ahead, you. Me? Yeah, you said you had another one. Yes, I do. Um, I've been impressed with how many different inst institutions you've worked in. Could you talk? It's four. <laughs> okay, they were very big. <laughs> would you talk? Would you talk about uh, what what you feel uh, makes you a good leader? What what? Wh where did you get some of those skills from? Where, where how did you become one? You I was I was very fortunate to have an extraordinary experience at MIT. Um, I started in 1965 shelving books in the humanities library at MIT. That was that was my introduction to library work. And I, I was a, an undergraduate at Northeastern University. It was my co-op job. Uh, I was an education major, and they thought shelving books was pretty close to education. <laughs> um, so I fought, actually fought with my co-op advisor. I did not want to go shelve books, um, but she finally twisted my arm. And now takes credit. She's still alive, and now takes credit for me being the archivist of the United States. <laughs> my name is Nancy Caruso. Um, I was fortunate that I had a, um, a woman, Frances Sumner, who was the associate humanities librarian, who um, kind of kept her eye on me and realized that I had uh, capacity beyond shelving. <laughs> and she created um, a junior library assistant position for me as a co-op student. So I got to do things beyond shelving. You know, I got to file shelf list cards, above the rod. <laughs> For those of you who don't know what that means, someone um, who's untrained can shelve a card above the rod that holds all the cards in the drawer, and then someone comes after you and checks your work, and, <laughs> and if it's okay, they pull the rod. They pull the rod. You don't get the satisfaction. <laughs> they pull the rod and drop the card. 
so I, you know, and my career at MIT was like that. I had, they were all women, the director of the library, uh, Natalie Nicholson, who's now 101. Do you know she's still alive? She's in Newport, Rhode Island. Um, and uh, the head of the cataloging department for Needleman all kept an eye out for me and created opportunities for me to grow. So um, this um, informal career path, mentoring kind of experience was something that early on I came to understand and appreciate and have tried in my entire career to create those opportunities for my staff. Um, so learning um, you know, that way. Um, I, I, I made, you said I had a lot of jobs, um, I spent 31 years at MIT, which, you know, that's a long time. Um, so move, making the move from MIT to Duke was, you know, really, you know, that was a, that was a difficult decision to make. But it became clear to me in my interviewing at Duke that I knew enough about the problems that were there and enough of, of, uh, to realize that there would be a lot of growth for me in this new position and that I could make a difference. The, the, my belief that I could make a difference was the deciding factor for me. It's exactly the same thing that brought me from um, Durham, North Carolina to New York City and from New York City to, um, to Washington. That I knew enough about the business. Uh, I would learn in this new environment, but I could also you know, contribute a whole lot. And that, that was the, that was it.